I'm Eric Halivni from Toldot Israel, sitting here on April 19th with Mishalom Rikvis in Tel Aviv. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your family, where you were born, a little bit about uh, growing up? Okay. Um, my story has been published so many times because I was sort of an unusual case. Uh, so I will explain to you a little bit. First of all, I'm a Zibale. You know what a Zibale is? A seven-month baby. As a matter of fact, we have a letter that we have found out that my father wrote to his brother. Um, that's the grandpa of, um, of Reckless, the uh, producer, um, saying that Betty just gave birth uh, this morning at 5 o'clock, that's how I found out what time I was born. 5 a.m. to a seven months premature baby, we hope he will live. So now I'm sitting in front of you. Second, uh, I'm a direct descendant of the Baal Shem Tov. You know who the Baal Shem Tov is? So the, these two things sort of uh, went through my life, uh, being a direct descendant of the Baal Shem Tov and the... Um, and a, and a seven months baby, so I was always in a hurry. Um, I was born uh, in Turkey. My father, after he graduated Liverpool University, um, went, came through Russia preaching Zionism and stopped in Odessa. And uh, he was arrested for uh, for preaching Zionism and uh, was put in jail, but by then he met my mother. My mother, thank, thanks to what happened, uh, had a big house which they were uh, delegated to their basement and the communist judge took over the, uh, the house for his own use. My mother went to plead with the judge to let my father go. The judge said, I'll let him go if he will go on a, on, a, on a boat and move out. So she married my father, put him on a boat, and said she will come in a little while. My father speaks nine, spoke nine languages. Amongst them, he was in the Turkish army in World War I. He was an officer in the Turkish army. Therefore, he spoke Turkish. He spoke English, he spoke French, he spoke German. He spoke Russian, he spoke Jewish, he spoke Hebrew, uh, and the immigration was coming from Romania, Bulgaria, Russia, uh, through uh, Istanbul, through Constantinople, and therefore he was able to find a job with the British immigration. And he stayed over there in, in Constantinople, Constantinople waiting for my mother. Where was he born? My mother was born near Kiev mm -hmm. and came to Israel when the Gymnasia Herzliya, Herzliya High School, was established as the first Hebrew school. So he left at the age of 13. He left Russia, came to, to Tel Aviv. He had already an aunt living in, in Tel Aviv who was one of the first uh, Hebrew-speaking kindergarten teachers. Uh, so he stayed with her for a while, and then I don't know where he stayed, but he ended up in graduating the, the Hebrew Herzliya High School uh, together with Moshe Sharet, I don't know if you know the name, and they, in the first four Machzorim, the first four uh, graduating classes, lived and worked together. And when he graduated, he had a choice. All Russian citizens had a choice of either going to Egypt or staying in Israel. If they stayed in Israel, they had to accept uh, Ottoman uh, citizenship, which he did, and therefore they had to go to the army. My father, being what he was, became an officer right away and uh, then trained the Macedonian's army and then became the official interpreter to Gamal Pasha. Gamal Pasha was the, the Turkish overseer of Israel and uh, so on and so forth. At the end of World War I, 
My father realized that his education was cut off, so he went to England uh, at the behest of Chaim Weizmann and, and studied with Chaim Weizmann and studied with, uh, as a student with his, with his younger brother, Chilik, who was Ezra Weizmann's father. And he studied there, and when he finished, he accepted the mission to go to Russia to tell the Jews to come to Israel, met my mother, was in jail, was out of jail, was in Constantinople. My mother came to Constantinople. She was pregnant already. And lo and behold, Rickless came out, Mishulam came out as a seven-month baby. So they stayed in Istanbul for a few, for two or three months. When year was this? 1923, December 1923. He stayed in Istanbul for a few months just to clean up and and to see, make, because I was a premature, to make sure that I will survive. Uh, there were no uh, incubators at the time over there, so they covered me with uh, cotton. So, um, and then when I was three months old, we immigrated to, to Israel. And my father continued to work in Jerusalem for the British government in the immigration, and then went through various things in business and otherwise. Uh, ended up with Hiddick Weizmann uh, as, a father, as his father in um, ICI, and they represented ICI, that's Imperial Chemical of, of England, they represented it. And then my father went into the orange export business, and that's when he excelled until the war. While all this was going on, I at first, they didn't have any money, and so I went to a, another school, not actually high school. Where were you living? Back in Tel Aviv now, mm -hmm. because when he went into the chemical business with Aza's uh, father, he moved to, from Haifa to, to Tel Aviv. And, um, and then, uh, at, uh, at the age of uh, nine, uh, I began to go to Hatsley High School. And I graduated at the High School 25 years after my father. So that's the basic part of my youth. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have a sister. She's in the, at the palace here. It's a Moshe Pskinim high class. You know what a Moshe Pskinim is? Mm -hmm. High class. And I see her almost daily when, I, when I'm here. That's why I'm at this hotel, because it's very convenient for me. Um, and she, she's a sculptress, and her husband uh, was also in the British Army, and she, we married about the same time. I was in Italy, in North Africa, came back with the rabbi, with the chaplain, uh, and, um, and then she met, he, they were formed the Jewish Brigade when I came back from Italy. I was already all over North Africa, Angio, and Italy, and uh, they just began, made the deal with the government, the, Amer the British government, to establish a Jewish brigade. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's, uh, let's go back. Let's let go uh, back, yeah. Okay, so you, you grew up, you go, now you go to... Uh, now I go to Hatsley High School, and uh, I excelled in many things, mainly mathematics and history, and became one of the, leader, one of the leaders of the... Uh, actually a high school scout movement. As a matter of fact, when I graduated, I stayed six months to lead. At the same time, I, was, I graduated uh, the Haganah course for officers, so I stayed in here. At that time, we were allowed to have a, a, a semi-automatic army under the British because the, the, the British wanted volunteers to the British Army, and they wanted to train the Israeli uh, underground for what will come. Uh, I'm not going to talk about what they did, but they were doing it with, uh, with, with uh, not with a full heart. Uh, but they, they established a brigade, and the brigade got training. How did you decide to... 
uh, sign up to be part of the Haganah? Was that something that your friends were doing? Oh, there's, there's no such thing as not, not being in Haganah. You're either in Haganah or the Irgun or you were in nothing. Uh, and uh, nice Jewish boys uh, were either in the Haganah or the Irgun. I went to the Haganah because the scout movements established today a place called Maagan Michael is the establishment of the scouts um, kibbutz. You know Maagan Michael? It's between halfway between here and Haifa. And they uh, raise fish and so on and so forth. Very large kibbutz. Uh, very interesting story about that. They were near uh, Rehovot, which was uh, the, uh, the, the um, railroad station. And they were planning to go to a place of their own. So they were being trained and they walked. And Ben-Gurion, who knew them, because Ben-Gurion's daughter went a grade behind me and Ben-Gurion's son was two grades above me, he was very connected with the, uh, with the uh, graduates of Hatsley High School. Uh, and he saw, he saw them as the most uh, loyal and reliable. And um, it's a very interesting story because he, the war was over and he was able to buy uh, machine gun uh, machinery to make machine gun bullets. The question was where to put it. <coughs> he, uh, the, the British intelligence knew exactly that Israel bought in Romania. Um, 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 bullets, bullets machinery, uh, bullets making machinery, and they knew the boat that it was loaded on, and they followed the boat. Uh, the Israeli had also a spy within the British, so they took the ship at night, brought it to Beirut, and unloaded the machinery in Beirut without the British intelligence knowing. So when they arrived in Haifa, the first thing the, the British did is brought the machinery, brought the boat uh, to Haifa, searched it and couldn't find anything because it was already unloaded in Beirut and then brought by trucks to the kibbutz of the scouts. But by then I was in the army by then, uh, they only those that were in the kibbutz and or were there in Palmach, because if you didn't go to the army, you either went to do the Palmach or you were a, a, a local nothing. Uh, and um, so they, if you go to near Rehovot, there's a place called Lamala Lamata, upstairs, downstairs. Over there between the kitchen and the bakery, underneath were two holes going down to a whole factory of bullets on the bottom. It's called La Mala La Mata. It's worthwhile seeing because I gave them the money to, to rebuild it. And um, I took my family over there to show it to them. And the people that were walking over there, they had to go through uh, a, a um, sun baking room in order not to look like they were walking on the ground. That's how they fooled the British. And when, when there was a uh, Etzel um, Pigua, uh, terrorism uh, against the the army, the British army, in, the, in its train, this is already the end of the war. And, and that's how we got released from the British army very fast. Uh, they brought their wounded to Rehovot, to the kibbutz, and our doctors took care of them, and they did not suspect that right underneath there's the uh, bullet factory for the Sten guns. Anyhow, that, that's the, that, these are the people that I was part of. But I went for the call to the army. And I'm not, not the only one. There were 50 or 75,000 Israelis that joined the British army.
this, this is you had you had said you were doing Haganah training when you were finishing yeah. Herzl High School. I failed to say that a year after I graduated, forty one to forty two, that year I was a member of the kibbutz training in Dganya. Mm -hmm. You know what Dganya is? However, I stayed half the time in Tel Aviv training the Haganah and heading the, the uh, Tzofim, heading the, the scouts. At the end was the, was the call for joining the British Army or the Palmach. And I joined the British Army because of my English. I spoke English. Oh, you spoke, did you yes. speak English at home? No, but uh, we, we went to England. I went to school in England for a while uh, as a kid. And, uh, but did you have family? Where, where did your, your parents family? My parents, were in, my parents were in Tel Aviv. But did, there, did they still have family in... In Russia? Russia? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had four cousins for whom I bought four automobiles in Russia in 1972. <laughs> at the post office. You don't buy cars in, a, uh, in Russia. At the, it was during the communist era. And then, of course, they all left Russia having had the uh, chance to sell the cars and make money. So I went into the British Army. And uh, as soon as I got into the British Army, circumstances came. And first of all, I was with the uh, military police because I spoke Hebrew and English. And there were military police stations all over Israel. And they wanted English speaking. There was not as much English speaking in those days as they are today. Today everybody speaks English. In those days they weren't. So as soon as I passed my basic training, they took me to the military police. And I served in the military police for about three, two, three months. And only then went to a, uh, an Israeli unit. Then I got sick, we joined this. Make a long story short, I became a driver to the Jewish chaplain. You were, the whole time you were in Palestine though? No, I was in Egypt. Oh, after, I, for the, a while, after the military police, you were sick. after the military police. I was back. I was in Egypt. Most Israeli units were engineering or service or things of that kind. They were not battle. Uh, the only ones that were uh, that were uh, um, in the in this in the military, actual military before that. They were troubadours in, 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 uh, in Greece and so on and so forth, uh, units. But the, uh, the fighting battle, the fighting units, there was only one. It's called the Buffs. The Buffs was used in Israel for guard your duty. Until later on, when I came already two years later from Israel, and the fighting was in Italy, I came back to Israel from from um, Italy, and when I came, that's when my father and I went to see Eliyahu Golob, who was head of the Haganah, and my father was one of the originators of the Haganah. So he, I, we went to see him, and he told me, we have just signed a deal with the British that we're going to have a brigade. This is, this is later on, though. This is... This is two and a half years later. Okay, so yes. let's... Uh, let's uh... You're in, you're in Egypt, you go to, you're sent to Egypt, yeah. you're working there and then you get sick? I got sick and I get to base, it's, that, that is not important. But then you came I end to... up as a driver to the Jewish chaplain. And who was the Jewish chaplain? Ephraim Orbach. He was a, a Jewish chaplain of the British Army. Yes, Ephraim Orbach was an Ishiyut by himself, you know what Ishiyut means. Mm -hmm. Can um, you tell me a little bit about him? Yes. He was a professor of Jewish studies at the Hebrew University. He's a graduate of the University of Berlin and in Italy, a university in Italy. He was a doctor of philosophy. One of the most unusual guys and a right leaning. He would be today with the Tanyao. Yet he was orthodox. Yet he believed that the Israeli children have to be a serve in the army. He was an unusual person. Uh, and a very tragic, a firstborn son 
was in the artillery in the Israeli army later on and, and, uh, and died in an accident in, in the artillery. But Ephraim Obach, one, at one moment, was, uh, was chosen by the Likud to be their representative, their representative for the presidency of Israel. He did not win because, as you know, Israel shifted from being Avoda and Apoalim uh, to the right over the period of time. And now, of course, there are so many, uh, so many parties and so many uh, things. So, but he was, he was nominated and did not win. I don't remember who won it against him, but uh, very interesting person, very interesting person. And, and, and he, he was wonderful. And here I was, an 18, 19 year old kid, and, I, and we traveled all along North Africa. We were, Alamein, it started in Alamein when Montgomery won against Rommel and pushed them back. And we pushed, there was only one road all along North Africa. And we stopped from Alexandria to Alamein, from Alamein to Tobruk, from Tobruk to uh, Libya, from Libya to Tripoli. In Tripoli, we stopped, and basically there were three, four Israeli units in Tripoli that moved with the forces, service unit, engineering unit, and so on and so forth. And uh, Urbach chose to stay in Tripoli. And that's where my life begins to be most interesting, and I'm coming to it. One uh, background question before sure. that. Was your family traditional? Was your family... No, my, father, my father's father was very traditional. My father's mother kept kosher until she died. And we used to come to her to eat the good stuff that she prepared. Uh, I have pictures, by the way, of, of the family when I was 13. Uh, and you can see my grandma too, and my father and my mother, and my sister. Um, my father, um, my father came to Israel and broke the mold. He was in a cheder, you know what a cheder is? And he broke the mold when he came to Herzliya High School to study in the first Hebrew school. He was a Zionist of the first degree. Only later on in life, when things sort of didn't turn exactly in Israel the way he wanted to, and Jews were fighting Jews, uh, which is where Ben-Gurion in the early days was smart, fighting the eight cell. Either you join, or we're going to go against you. And, and Begin joined. Uh, but uh, my father uh, only once commented is that the Jews are like salt. You spread them amongst the goyim and they give a lot of taste. But you put them all together in one place, it's Lot's wife. <laughs> but the only time he spoke against Zionism that I remember. I was a very, very highly intelligent man. Every Friday afternoon, he and the group of the Herzliya, guys that went to school together, would study Talmud and uh, would spend a lot of time with each other. He bought all the land where Habima, Man, and, uh, and, and the street down there. It's called Shkunat Miklis in the original maps of Israel. Chob Marmorek, Marmorek Street, that time, where just in front of where they are doing all the changes now of the uh, Abima, that was the end of Tel Aviv when I was 12, 13. And my father had a lot of relationship with, with Arabs because he spoke Arabic, he spoke uh, English, he spoke French and German, and so on and so forth. And he was able to negotiate through Arabs Christian Arabs that he was dealing with in the oranges and was able to buy the whole area because they weren't selling to Jews. So they sold to Ishmael, 
who was a friend of my father, and he mail sold it to my father. But he was a a um, a um, Christian Muslim from Egypt, but he was with my father in business. So. Um, uh, that 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 was Israel, and uh, he, no tradition at all. We never kept kosher. We didn't eat chazir, uh, and we didn't eat shellfish like I do today. But uh, in those days, uh, I didn't know about shellfish, and I didn't know about chazir. <laughs> and uh, and uh, in the British Army, we ate what they gave us. But uh, no, no tradition at all. But we are still a traditional family. I mean, every Pesach is the family's traditional Seder, and now we have to have it in two places. I was, well, I was curious, because, uh, because you were assigned to the chaplain, if you were, and also you mentioned that you're a descendant of the Baal yes. I was curious if yeah, that was... Uh, yeah. No. They, they, the interesting thing about that is uh, Le- uh, Levi, my, my uncle, uh, to whom the letter was sent from Istanbul that I was born to seven months, and my father were the intellectuals of the family. Otherwise, there were women over there. They, there were no more brothers. Um, and um, the, he was head of the, um, of the teacher's school, both in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv, the teacher's uh, universities. He knew the rabbi. So when the rabbi was offered to have a Rickles as a driver, he accepted me with open arms because I was Levy's uh, nephew. Uh, it, it's all walked together over a period of time. And he was a very, very unusual man. Uh, he um, I mean, we would travel for days on the road until we come to a Jewish unit, to a, uh, an Israeli unit, and we stay overnight. Uh, and he would sit with the Talmud and while I was driving. Now, I'm 19. And he would go, he'd, he'd study Baba Kama and Baba Metziah and, and so on and so forth. I, I studied in high school, but who remembers? And he would say to me, Rickless, now what would you do if you had a hole and somebody fell into it and, and so on and so forth? I'd give him the logic. And he would say to me, good, good, Rickless, good. I used to call me Rickless, good, because you, you really go the logic with the Talmud. <laughs> so that's how we spent all the time. And... Uh, as example, when we were in Italy, um, I took my son to the uh, Holocaust Museum in, in New York, in uh, Washington. And we passed by a picture, and all of a sudden I saw people I knew. And I stood over there, and my son said, he was 14, said, Dad, what's the matter? I said, I know these people. These were the Israeli paratroopers that went behind the... Uh, the um, the, uh, the German lines and to t- try to get the Jewish, um, the Jews in, in especially in, in Budapest, not to accept the Germans' offer to work, Arbeit, uh, because the camps are not work camps, they are gas camps. And that's where Hannah Senesh was. And these guys, before they went behind, we were in, in Bari and we had dinner with them. And I knew them because I was privy to being the driver to the Jewish chaplain. You follow me? Mm-hmm. Or we would visit, uh, we were at the casino front and uh, it was Passover. So there was an engineering unit of, 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 uh, of Israel, so we had a big sign and put up a big tent and said, on this corner, it's 15 miles from casino, on this corner, which is a corner of all the roads that lead to the casino, on this corner, on such and such a date, there is going to be a Jewish Seder. All Jewish personnel, whatever units you are, are welcome. And 
and I was in charge of providing the matzah and the chocolate and the stuff that needed for the, and I went to the American army and all the American quartermasters were, <laughs> were Jews. <laughs> they loaded my truck with Manishevich's matzah, with chocolate from Hershey's, with uh, eggs <laughs> to make the eggs, with uh, uh, gefilte fish that they sent to the Jewish soldiers in, uh, in the army in, in Italy. And we had a Seder. They were British. They were British serving with the uh, Indian Brigade. There were South Africans in the South African 6th Division, called the Desert Rats. There were Polish who were wiped out on Mount Casino. There were Czechs, a few Czechs, who were part of the Jewish, of the, uh, of the Polish Brigade that were wiped out. They, they thought, I'm not telling you what the British did. They sent them on foot in the back, and they were all wiped out going up the hill because at that time they knew already we were making deals with the Russians. And they didn't want the Polacks to be on their hand. Ah, oh, you don't know those things. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And, um, and we had a Seder. Lord Rothschild from England, set by the rabbi. I sat with all the Israelis that were shaking my hands for having matzahs that were not made in North Africa, but made in Manishemitz in, in the United States. And it, uh, I, I lived uh, the life with the rabbi, although I, I had to eat kosher because he wouldn't eat non-kosher. So I would stop and I would cook and I would do all the things wherever we were and exchange the non-kosher stuff for eggs and for tomatoes and for everything. And we were, we were like friends. Uh, the, the funniest thing, and I don't want to, you should erase that, but his wife, when he died, sent me the obituary. By then, I was earning a $5 billion company. And I was a big shot. And I was after the Yom Kippur War where I came in. And they wrote stories about me. She wrote me uh, his obituary and in it, it said, his claim to fame, however, is was that Rickless was his driver. <laughs> that was very funny. Uh, she kept uh, in, in touch with me when he died. And um, now, and we were into North Africa. And here is where the story really becomes interesting. We were in Tripoli. When the Americans came from the other side, Algiers, and against the French Vichy government, and the British came from this side before the uh, invasion to Sicily. What year is this? Uh, God, 44, something like that. Okay. Um, I, I don't ask me, uh, uh, yeah, but I lived it. Uh, um, the, um, maybe 43. The, um, we, we went to three most interesting places that became later part of Israel because they came en gros, they came in total, in totality from Jerba, you know what Jerba is? They came from Jerba, they came from Tigrina and Garian. Tigrina, T-I-G-R-I-N-A, and Garian, G-A-R-I-A-N. These were the Jews that lived in caves on, on the entrance to the Sahara Desert. We were there, we were in Jerba, put the truck on the thing, and all kinds of incidents are in, in those. And I'll, I'll really, I sent them a letter in here because my, my uncle worked for Haaretz and, and he printed it. But, and we entered Tunis with the, when the British and American met in Tunis, and most of Tunisians came to Israel, unlike the Algerians or the, uh, 
or the Moroccans, a lot of them came. But many are, there are many Algerians and Moroccan Jews still left in Algeria and Morocco. And the Tuni Tunisians, even though they were very, um, very respective of the Jews, uh, but what happened, the Nazis came over and took over Tunis. And they took over the Jewish synagogue and they, they killed a lot of Jews. They sent them to war camps, which they didn't do in Morocco and Algiers because it was Vichy government. But Tunis they took over because uh, Tunis, uh, even though it was semi half Italian, half, half French, they were able to do whatever they want. And the guy, and this was last night on the, on the show, the guy, the German general that came, that liquidated the Jews in Auschwitz, he was preparing to send them to the camps in Poland, uh, also for uh, extermination. But we went to Gerba, and we saw the Jewish community. Now here's the Jewish community, and there was yesterday on the thing too, which, and I was there. They were the Tzorfim, you know what Tzorfim? They were the, um, the, the workers in, in um, jewelry. They were the, jewel, the jewelers of Europe. And therefore they had a lot of gold. In those days, it was not so much in diamonds, it was a lot of gold. And the, the Germans knew that they have gold and silver. And they knew they got their hiding. So the Germans told them, on a certain date, we want you to bring us 50 kilograms of gold. They didn't know how much they have. And the rabbi himself went around and collected 50 kilos of gold. And then two or three weeks later, they said, if you don't give us 50 kilos more of gold and silver, we will send you, or we will kill you, or we will do something. And again they went and they collected. Lucky enough, by then Montgomery came over. And we were incidents over there. They, they lived in a, on an island, Jerba. Very few of them were westernized. They lived, when I went there to have dinner with the family, we sat on the floor. One big plate in the middle, and there was couscous in the plate. And all the kids and all the adults, and of course the father takes first and then the guest of the house, and you take it with your hand and you smash it until you get the oil out of it and you eat it. That's the way they lived. You understand? And here I am experiencing all that. Of course, the rabbi went with the rabbi. I went with the, another family who, uh, who one of the sons was a tailor and he was a westernized. westernized. So we were in Jerba. Uh, on Shabbat, they were taking the Torah and they were going Shabbat and then they stopped. I said, what are you stopping? Tchum Shabbat. You know what Tchum Shabbat is? You have Tchum Shabbat. There's a uh, area beyond which you cannot travel. You cannot take the Aron, the Sefer, Sefer Torah, uh, beyond that area. So then everybody turns around and they go back to the synagogue. And they sing and they dance and the women, the, the, the Bthulot, unmarried, uh, and I'm sure they were Bthulot, wore white. And the, uh, the married one wore black. And that's how you knew <laughs> what's what. <laughs> so that was Jerba. And what were you doing there? What were you... Oh, I was, I was driving the Jewish chaplain. We came on a boat. We drove our truck on the boat. And the boat, you know, with the, with the machinery, <laughs> with, the, with the thing goes from from the shore of the North Africa to the, to, the, to the Jerba Island. That was an experience 
and all Jeroboam came to Israel because they suffered under the German and they knew that no place to stay there because the Arabs helped the, uh, helped the Germans. Second one was from Tripoli. We went to Garian and Tigrina. These were Jews that lived in caves in the borders of the Sahara Desert. And it's very interesting. The caves were like a hotel today, but upside down. There was a cave going down about a kilometer, and kuchim, and the little holes all around, and that's where they lived. However, they knew that enemies can come, they knew they can throw fire into the place, and they needed a place to escape. There was a secret place, would not let us know. It was a secret place that only certain people in the community knew where they would gather in case of trouble and walk in underground until they reach a faraway place where the enemy was not there. We arrived, they were all farmers. They were originally with Hammurabi. And they settled over there, and because of all the enemies, and they were Jews, they were unusual, and they were farmers, and you know, so they need they needed to build themselves a place where they can live. If they were a, a, a village, it'll be like a pogrom every month and Donnerstick. But instead, they built these, and that's how their social life was. But we arrived. And when the community, somebody in the community heard that we are there and the rabbi is there, they said, wonderful that you're here. There is Peter Rechem Chamor. Now you know what Peter Rechem Chamor? The firstborn of anything belongs to God. Peter Rechem Chamor, that means the firstborn of a Chamor. Or a, or a, a donkey, or a, what's the, the, the female donkey. And you have, you, you have to sell it. Because otherwise, you, you, you can't finish. So now, we had to bring the people from the field into the synagogue for the Peter Hamor ceremony. You understand? And they were walking in the field. And the woman had her period and she wouldn't drive in the car with us. But we had a, so a semi-truck, an 800. She sat on top of the truck, not to be in touch with any one of us. And we brought her to the Petr Rechem Chamor ceremony. And her husband sat with us in the, in the car. And we had a Petr Rechem Chamor. Now you have to understand, to express their delight. I don't know if they still do it in, the, in, the, in, the, in these communities, but that's the way they express their delight. So as soon as they went up the brochos come around, especially the white ones and the black ones, and they all, and they all gold and uh, all kinds of things. And they are on Torah comes out of the synagogue and carried. And the Aaron Torah is from Chabonitzki. It's, it's from Solomon's days. Because that's where the Jews immigrated. All the North African Jews. You understand? Hey, it's unbelievable. So that's the second element which is unbelievable. They all came to Israel. Because the Israeli government sent after the war, sent Israelis. I was already in the United States. But they sent Israelis, they knew and all those things, they knew where the Jews were. I had no idea there were Jews in Gary and in Tigrina. Who, who was interested when, I, when you're in the army in Tripoli and, and there's so much fun there to go to Gary and but, but the rabbi did. 
was he, what was his reaction to this? Well, his reaction was traditional. In other words, he was living with the Jewish communities. But he's an Ashkenazi. He's, uh, I mean, he went. Yeah, but he was a highly intelligent man. He was a man of the book. He was a professor of Jewish studies. This was a uh, for him is a is a huge, huge uh, part of his life, and he encouraged the shlichim later on to go to these places to bring them all, because they there was no chance that they will will do over there. They they the sifrei kodesh that they had. Uh, they, who the hell knows? I, I have no idea. I was a kid. I, was, I, I came back from there, got married, and a year later I came to the United States. So, but who the hell knows? Some people must have gotten to study them, to see what part of the Bible is missing because they were not part of the, of the Talmud uh, Bavli and so on and so forth. And I don't, they don't even know what Talmud is. And the third most uh, beautiful thing was we arrived in Tunis. And Tunis suffered. The Jews in Tunis suffered a great deal under the German boot. Uh, they, they were killed. They were taken to camp. And, and last night, it was, I remembered again all the stories that they told us. But the interesting thing is there was a teacher, a Hebrew school teacher, continued to teach Hebrew. In there was a shaliach from Israel originally. His name was Yerushalmi. And he was continued to teach Hebrew school and they were studying Hebrew school beseta in, 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 um, without permission. Um, and, um, and they um, they um, they were very happy. I mean, the, all the Jewish community in Tunis, although they they have a whole list of people that would die, that took to taken to Auschwitz and so on and so forth. But uh, they they were, uh, and most of the Tunisian um, Jewish population came to Israel. And by the way, both the Tripolitani and the Tunisians. Jewish communities, but great Jewish communities. I mean, they took care of the of the needed, needy, uh, and so on and so forth. You said that in Tunis, you what happened with the Beit Knesset there? The big what? The with the synagogue. With the, what happened? Oh, the synagogue was taken over by by the Germans, and uh, they were using it as a warehouse to store all the things that they collected from the Jews. Every time there was a Jewish family, they had a machi um, washing machine, they had a, this machine or that machine, they collected it over there. They were going to take it away and bring it to the Germany or something like that. And of course they didn't have a chance. And then Montgomery came down and, and uh, Roosevelt came from the other side, the Americans. and. Um, and then uh, I did not, I did not invade, we did not invade Sicily. I mean, both the British army and the American army invaded. There was a big battle between uh, uh, Montgomery and uh, what's the name of the general, the American general that later on? Rommel. Hmm? Rommel. No, Rommel is the German. I'm talking about the American general that uh, was, was killed later on. Uh, but he had many battles. He, he studied Rommel and he had a big battle. He, he, he defeated Rommel real good in Tunis. Um, what, what's the, what was his name? Uh, they made a movie on him. Um, so he, um, he was a great general. I mean, typical German general. <laughs> He, but he was, he went to battle and they used him later on and they, Montgomery Ward said, you don't take Messina. Messina was the capital and it was a 
the end on, on the way to Italy. Of course, you go, go tell uh, this general not to do that. He went so fast, reached Messina, and when Montgomery came from the other side, he came down to greet him. <laughs> it was an insult to, to Montgomery. Um, but he, he was a great general. I arrived already with the invasion uh, of Italy in, um, in um, uh, not Brindisi, but uh, south of, of Naples. So you left, you were in North Africa until that point, and then yeah. you went from there to Italy? To Italy, yeah. With, still with the... Uh, still with the British, uh, British Army, still with the rabbi. Still with the rabbi. Yeah. I, for a while, I changed from him to the rabbi of the Fifth Army, uh, who came from London. Okay. He since died. Uh, he was not as, as, uh, as learned. He was a rabbi in one of the synagogues. Who was it? Um, I don't know. I, later on, when I, uh, when I owned uh, Shenley Whiskey in England, uh, I decided to look him up. I knew the synagogue. And um, I called, and his son answered. His son was assistant rabbi. And his son answered. And uh, I told him, he, he, of course, he knew me because the rabbi kept on talking about me all the time. And um, he said, come tonight. Come to services Friday night. So I came, I took a taxi, and I came to the synagogue. And I came a little late, and I entered. And it was amazing. The moment I entered the synagogue, the rabbi saw me, and he said to his son, who is assistant rabbi, he says, Rickness is here. He recognized me. <laughs> it's already, a, a, I bought Shenley in the late 60s. <laughs> so it's already um, 20, 25, 25, 26 years he hasn't seen me. And, um, and he invited me to his house for dinner, of course. We went to dinner. And he died uh, of cancer a couple of years later, but his son took over. But we were, the most important thing was the Seder, 15 miles from, from, uh, from uh, Mount Casino. And then what happened, the American got stuck uh, north of Naples. The Germans gave them resistance. And they decided to uh, bring the, Amer the British troops from Casino so that we will, the British, we will go with the Americans along, the Americans will go along the shore, the British will go in the middle, and the Indians and so on and so forth, <coughs> the Polish, <coughs> they will take Casino, because Casino was, without Casino you couldn't go. And um, as a result, the Americans, uh, Fifth Corps and, and the two, two American uh, armies invaded um, Anzio, the Anzio beachhead. And what happened is the, the, the general commanding the force got scared, it was too, too easy. So began to consolidate instead of going on. And what happened is the, the Germans then came and they brought big guns on the railroads on the mountain. But we had control of the air. So what they did is they take the guns out at night. At night, your life was not your own. We were 10 square miles. But it was amazing. It was an amazing. I was in the Anzio Beachhead. It was amazing. And it gets me. I never, never went back there until three years ago. And I went there and I went to the, to the cemetery. And I saw all the fallen Americans. And every now and then you see a Mug and David. And, uh, and you think about the ungrateful Italians and the French and the, and especially I hate them the 
the, the, the ones that never fought the Dutch and the, and, the, and the Belgians and the Czech, who are the biggest anti-Semites in Europe today. Um, and they never fought. We gave them freedom. And in both in, 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 in the shores of England, of France, you have all the cemeteries. And in, in um, I, I finally went to, um, to Angio and, and saw it. And then, and then from Angio, the British came on the side, the Indians came from, casi from Casino, the Americans went along the coast, and Angio pushed, and we took Rome. And from, from the interesting thing is that the Germans could have devastated Rome. They did not. They moved to the other side, the Tiber. And uh, until the Americans consolidated, then they went back. The Jewish Brigade came later on and they fought in Siena. Uh, that's where they first fought. I, we went to Rome, I entered Rome, that was very, I wrote about that to, uh, here to the paper too. That was the most interesting. Uh, we, we drove three hours. This is with Orbach again? Yes. Or no? no, with the uh, no, Orbach, with Orbach. Okay. Um, we drove for three hours and we were full of dust and we came to Rome and he went to school in Rome. I was in Rome as a child and uh, I was at the hotel, I recognized the hotel, I recognized, Rome is very easy to recognize. And we came to the Jewish section where the, the synagogue is, is by the, by the Tiber. And you could see, you could feel that people are looking at you from everywhere. You feel like the eyes are coming at you. And, um, and you, uh, you go there and, and you, you don't see them. But there was a mug and David in our car. And suddenly a little kid comes around. He yelled, Abreu? I said, yeah. See. Si. He shouts, Ebreo, 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 and suddenly a thousand people come out from all the buildings, kissing the car to such a degree that all the dust was cleaned out. Can you imagine? And boy, Ebreo, because they, they were, the Nazis just left. They went across the river. That was probably one of the most exciting. And then I stayed in Rome for a year, and then I came back. And then a year later, I got out of the army. I came back and got out of the army within a few months because they didn't trust the Jews anymore because Etzel was doing... Uh, uh, Etzel was bombing all the, uh, all the uh, stations for the, uh, that the British used to to find out whether there are ships are coming or the radar. And one was in Haifa, right where our headquarters was. And there was a little, uh, little British soldiers that defected from a little Jewish, British soldier, but he was a, a Jinji. You know the Jinji is? It was a Jinji, and in the British accent, and he came with Edsel, and they bombed the Kamel Tsarfati where all the, uh, the radar station was. After that, they didn't trust us. I had to go with a machine gun all the time, and I was afraid that the Arab Legion would kill me because they were, they were watching. But uh, they they got us out, and then within a year, I was back, I was in the United States. When, when you were, what year was it that you were finishing in Italy? The war was over already. No, 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 no. The war, the war was not over, and uh, and um, the. Um, the American and British uh, D-Day had not come yet. The, in Italy, the fighting was in the mountains. That's where the Jewish Brigade was. And we were moving refugees all the time. 
So, moving refugees to where? From the north to the south. Of Italy. Yeah. And, then and from there to camps to go to Israel. So, I was not, I was not a leader there, but they used me because I had the driver, the chaplain, nobody will inspect me and I would move people around, but not as much as what the Israeli units did later on. Now, there, there were Americans that were also involved in this also, weren't there? Was that Friedman, yes, uh, there were always American soldiers in the Air Force and others that got very friendly with Israelis. And they used Americans. Israelis used everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, it was part of the Haganah. Uh, I, I was not part of it, except I did what they told me to do. When we came from Anzio, the rabbi, the British rabbi, the one that was in uh, in the synagogue in, in London, got sick. He got a medal. I didn't get anything, but he got a medal <laughs> for being in the Anzio with the soldiers. And he he was really shocked shell, or shell-shocked. And he ended up in the hospital. That's when they used me a lot to go back and forth. Because you, you were free then, you were... I was free, yeah. And, I, and I had, I'd signed the rabbi on everything that I could, and uh, so on and so forth. Will you bring... Are you here? Look, you, you have to understand, I received all the supplies for the Seder and Casino from Caserta from the Americans. I mean, they, they, Jews met, and when you meet, whether it's in Casino or in Caserta or in Naples, then the, we always established Jewish clubs everywhere, and the Americans were coming, and the Israelis were coming, and the British were coming. Everywhere. Now, the only thing is the, the Pollocks were wiped out. They went <laughs> hand to hand with the Germans. Uh, the, the Indians with the swords that they stayed in the British Army until a few months ago. The, um, the swords like that. Um, they all moved from India, uh, the Gurkhas. They all moved from India to England, and they remained in the British Army. And only recently, I guess they became rich and they done, didn't have as many kids that they wanted to go to the army, uh, that they just canceled it. And, and of course, it was a big scandal in England because they fought all the wars for British, for Britain. Gurkhas, G-U-R-K-H-A, Gurkha. And then, of course, I moved to the United States. I already have a wife and a child that was born when I got out of, the day I got out of the army, I had a child born. Wait, uh, let's, let me just finish up a little bit with, in Italy. Yeah. Were you, when you were going around with uh, Professor Rabbi Orbach, were you, was he thinking ahead to what was going to come next, to Jewish State, to what, connection no. this might be to people no in the future. no inkling no inkling even look there were 600,000 Jews in, in Israel but even when you were in North Africa even when we were in North Africa the state was established by one or two votes I was in the United States and I was listening to the United Nations voting and then there came a moment you needed that vote of South America, Peru, or Uruguay, or Paraguay, or one of those. And it was towards the end of the list. And it came. And the, and the cry of a state of Israel rose above the whole world. Israel was established. Not yet. 
the British, this was in sometimes in uh, in 47. Uh, I don't remember which one it was. It was November of 47. Uh, and the British uh, said that they will leave May 15th or May 1st or whatever it was. I wasn't here, so I don't know exactly the thing. But the bastards, you know what they did? I mean, every time they caught a Haganah member with arms, uh, they put him in Yafo in the uh, prison, and they release him at 7 o'clock at night. And the Arabs killed him. I mean, I, the only British that I like today are the Scots. They, they were, they were, I think the Scottish were a lost uh, tribe of Israel. I mean, they have the little, they, they got the spirit. And with all that Soros that they never have sun, they're always in a good mood. <laughs> but um, now I come to another era of mine, which is I'm in the United States. Why, when, uh, when did you get married? You got married while you were in I the Army? I got married while I was in the Army to my high school, high school sweetheart. And she got pregnant right away. And, and by the time my child was born, that is the week that I was released from the army, from the British army. They didn't trust the Israelis anymore. So they released all of the Israeli soldiers at one time. And when did you decide to go to America, or what did you go to? Oh, I always felt that I was going to go to study. I always wanted to study, and I wanted to go to study in England. Because my father went to a British school, and I was in England. Um, and I was in the British Army, and I thought that I could get the, uh, all the privileges that come with it. But I had friends that just left for England to study six months earlier. And England had the worst winter ever. And it was cold and miserable, and we had a child less than a year old. And they said, Zuska, that's my name, don't, don't come. Better go to the United States. And my, my wife had a friend that went to school with her, married an American soldier, and we sent her a detail. And she was accepted to five universities. I was accepted to what? In? In New Mexico. New Mexico. New Mexico. And she was accepted in New Mexico. So we came to the United States and went to New Mexico. I didn't even think there were Jews over there. <laughs> There were Jews, there was a synagogue, and there were good Jews. Now here, I'm going to... Albuquerque? Hmm? Albuquerque, New Mexico, yeah. And here, I'll make it very short. I went to school in New Mexico, and then we moved to Ohio because I got a job as a Hebrew school teacher. Where? At Columbus, Ohio. I went to Ohio State. I graduated within two and a half years. Then I went to graduate school. And I graduated in 1952. Graduate school also in? Also in Ohio Florida. State. I have a master's degree and a bachelor's degree. And the second child was born already in, uh, in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And I was offered a job in, uh, as a Hebrew school teacher for twice the money in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we moved over there. And I went to try to, I had a master's degree and I had letters of recommendations. And I went to the biggest investment banking house, Piper, Jeffrey, and Hopwood. And I said, uh, I, look for, look, I, look, I look for a job in the research department uh, from 8 to 12, because at 2.30 I have to leave. I need time for lunch and um, I have to leave to work. But I went from 12 to 2 as my time to do research. And I had an idea that I'm going to buy companies and sell companies and big, big uh, empires and so on. And by 84, by um, uh, 54, I bought the first company. At 55, I bought another company. By 56, I already bought and sold a company. I had Smith Corona. Ever heard of Smith Corona? At four and so on, made two million dollars, and here was a little Schmegeger Rickless, made two million dollars. 
And uh, then the group fought, and half of them went away. And by uh, 1956, uh, the end of '56, I already had a, a big company <laughs> that I controlled a billion dollars. And in '57, I made a billion dollars. And from there on, it's all history. So, um, and that's when the history goes back to my um, to my Jewish uh, background. I become in '57. I moved to New York '56, '57. I already am very wealthy. I already am made a million dollars. I already had. Uh, uh, I already had uh, companies that do business and import, and therefore Jews do business with me, and, and I become a very, uh, very big thing. And in the, in the early 60s, I sell one company and I buy, uh, you, know, you know America? Macquarie, McClellan, H.L. Green, Newbury, Lerner Shops, Oklahoma Tire and Supply, National Shirt Shops because I'm going to build a, um, a discount store. But I always go for that which I think I can bring Jews together because I become chairman of UGA in 1970. And in 67, I remember I was on the board of UGA. Who was the director of UGA then? Uh, who? Friedman, Herbert Friedman? Herbert Friedman was one, yes. Uh, did you know him in... Sure, I uh, knew him very well. But did you know him in Europe? No. No. Because he but was a chaplain in, uh, in the American Army. In the American Army. No, I didn't know him. Um, and, um, but I knew Herbert Friedman very well. And he was very well respected. So was I. I remember in 67, the Six-Day War, they asked me to speak, and I cried in 67, because I thought Israel was going to be wiped out. Much I knew. You follow me? And, uh, and in 70, I became chairman of UJA. I was chairman of three years. And I was in Israel during the war of um, Yom Kippur. And my daughter was already in Israel studying and married in Israel. That's the story of my life. I want to go back to a couple things, if sure. that's all right. Um, first, just for a second, if, as Pella asked, if there was anything else that you remember about uh, Fry Morbach that... Uh, I never met him again. You never met him again? No. I was in, I was in the United right. States. Uh, Ben Gurion for a while wouldn't let me come to Israel. Why? Because when Israel was established in the late '67, in, for, in, in '47, I wrote a letter to um, the Jewish agency. And they called me back, and I said, I am prepared to go back to fight for the independence. And they said, well, we have in two weeks, we have a boat leaving. I said, well, I need three, three places. I need for me and my wife and a child. Oh, no, 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 forget it. We have just one place for you. It's not, not for a wife. And I said, what do you want me to do? You want me to leave my wife and the child in the United States with nothing? They said, well, we have cases like that. We'll give you a, um, a release. So they gave me a release, and I continued my study. In 1952, there was, there was no more war, and so on and so forth. And I did not go back. I didn't even think of going back. But uh, in '52, I was already in Minneapolis, and Humphrey was ex-mayor of Minneapolis, and I applied to the immigration to become an American citizen. And he made me a citizen. And it, it coincided 
Humphrey made me a citizen about 1955-56. And what does a Jew do when he has money and, uh, and, and uh, he now can go back to visit Israel? So I bought a car, took my wife and three children by then, because uh, another child was born in 54 in Minneapolis. And um, we come to New York and we're going to put the car on, the, on, a, uh, on a boat and send everybody to Israel and I'll meet them later on. Remember, there were no jets in those days. So um, I come over there and we, we needed a visa to go to Israel. So we come to the Jewish, by then as a consulate, come to the Jewish consulate and uh, who is there, who is the consul? The sh Moshe Hirsch was one of my scout leaders. Moshe, yeah, yeah, yeah. Visa? He says, oh, you did, my wife. And the three kids, no problem. You, I have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He says, you're on the list of not being in the army. I said, come on. <laughs> I'm now an American citizen. And at that time, there was a, a law, it's not there anymore, a law of uh, an ex-senator of Nevada, McCarran. The McCarran law that allowed American citizens to serve in, in another army. So Teddy Kolek was in town. I see Teddy Kolek. He, he argues with Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion says, nothing to it. And for two years, I fight. And then... One of the uh, Herzliya High School students was in Los Angeles and he was uh, a, a movie director. And had a movie he wanted to do in Israel. So he figured they won't leave him, they won't do anything to him. So he goes to Israel. They take his passport. And he goes to court. And the court had no problem. He was not in Israel during the creation of the State of Israel. He did not have to appear that he wants to go. The same case as me. And when the war was over, he stayed in the United States. He's an American citizen. He cannot serve in the army. And he didn't have to serve in the army. Next day, I was in Israel. <laughs> I came to Israel, and of course, uh, Teddy Kollek comes to see me. You, know, you knew Teddy Kollek? Of course I knew Teddy Kollek. From? I knew Teddy Kollek from before. Teddy Kollek is my age, uh -huh. a year older. Shimon Peres is a year older than me. And uh, they, uh, remember, my family was very well known in Israel. We, we were one of the, uh, of the early, early, early. My, my father went to school in Tel Aviv right. with all the G'doylim. You understand? And here I'm already a multimillionaire. And uh, of course everybody knows my name, but there were no, no fucking Israelis in, in, uh, in, in the United States. I was the Israeli, <laughs> the Israeli that did well, and, and I was working for Israel. And of course, so he, he wanted me to become a partner in the Sheraton Tel Aviv, that now doesn't exist. I became a partner, became the controlling interest, and, uh, and that went uh, down the drain. Because, you know, people come here and they do things, they're going to build a hotel and, and they bring all the things for the bathrooms and then they decide that they're not going to build it so they sell all the things in the bathroom and disappear back in South America. And Jews, what can I tell you? There was a business and Israel was open to all kinds of Jews that were do-gooders but actually were not do-gooders, didn't have the spirit. Uh, but I did. So how would you say, looking back, 60 years later, yeah. that uh, this background, this involvement, how does that impact on, uh, on the rest of your life? Total impact. Total impact. I can't, I can't stand like my kids and I always say, everything in Israel is terrific. The food, the, the this and that, except the people. <laughs> but it's not true either. Uh, there are all kinds of people in Israel. But you go, where, where do you want to go? You want to go to uh, Museum of Tel Aviv? 
the entrance, I gave them a million dollars, you'll see it in my name. You want to go to the museum in Jerusalem, you see there's a wall over there as you enter. All the original, <coughs> the original um, uh, contributors to the establishment of the museum, you see my name. You want to go to Arale Arif's place, the uh, part of the university in foreign, uh, I don't know what he calls it, one of the founders is reckless. You want to go to uh, the Ganya. Uh, they show me where I was there, the, the, the place where the people meet and so on and so forth. You go in, uh, reckless is a contributor. You want to, I gave, I would say, about $100 million. That's when $100 million was a lot of money. Why? Because that's me, that's my country. Betat Khan. You know, Betat Sanchan Rabban Gan. You come in as my name. You go to the Hadassah when it was uh, the 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 mount the mount um, whatever the mountain is. Scopus. Scopus was taken back. You see, it came Hadassah came to me again, a quarter of a million dollars, sixty-seven. Oh, in fifty-seven, oh, I can't remember. Betat Sanchan, I gave a quarter of a million dollars. Now you know, a quarter of a million dollars in fifty-seven. 58, it's a half a million dollars. 59, it's a million dollars. I'm sorry, 58, 57, 67 is a half a million dollars. 77 is a million dollars. 87 is two million dollars. 97 is four million dollars. Uh, 2007, it's eight million dollars. The equivalent of what I gave is today, Teddy Anderson, made his millions because of me. I gave him Carnival Cruise Line. It was mine. What do you mean? What do you mean? He gave $40 million to build, to, to build Ichilov here. I mean, Pisha, Pisha. What's $40 million 10 years ago for Teddy? I made him billions. I gave him Carnival Cruise Line. Now, it's true, I get to go in the owner's suite. <laughs> I don't pay. <laughs> and so on and so forth. I own uh, Cartier. A guy wants it to buy it for me. I said, why should I buy it to you? I get 40% off. He says, I give you for the rest of your life 40% off. So I sell it. I'm crazy. But my life is tied to Israel. I just bought an apartment here. And what, uh, what message, what, what message do you have for your, your children, your grandchildren, great My message is Israel. They all are involved. Each one, my son has built little schools for children in Shkunot, Shkunot Aluvot, the, the, uh, the areas that, of the pool. Right. He built schools. About six or seven or eight schools already. We build, we build, and my mother and father, we build parks in, in the Shkunot, uh, the needy. Uh, our whole life is Israel. My, my, my second daughter, my first daughter, the big one, her house is a center for every Jewish, excuse me one minute, can you close it? I'll get the call later. Uh, our life is around Israel. In my, in my older daughter, every concert, every meeting, every my wife, my ex-wife. Uh, you know, I don't. I am not active anymore. I'm 85. What do you mean? This is my my kids now. It's time for them. My daughter. You know my daughter, Marsha. She's Mishuga. She's she's in the she's the aristocrat of of um, culture. My second daughter is the aristocrat of making her home open for all the affairs that uh, everybody comes over there. The, the, the consul, the, the ambassador, the, and, and Pinchas Sapir, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, my son, he likes to do it his way. So he builds in his way. They all speak Hebrew. Do you have uh, any regrets? No. No, I, I, how can I have, I can I have any regret? I have 
three children from my first wife, two children from my second wife, who was not Jewish. The, the, the boy came here and served in the army for three months and wanted to become a parachutist. Arik Sharon, a friend of mine, I called Arik. He was sent and he proudly he goes with his uh, with his uh, uh, wings. Um, he's, he was at the university here. He went to, to, to Ulpan here. I was talking to him the other day. He was in a um, in a Passover uh, seder. He read the Hebrew. He said, everybody says, she said they were parsing. So uh, she was telling me she just arrived, his girlfriend, this Israeli. She says to me, every, when he read, she said, they talk Farsi, Farsi to each other. Oh, she says, Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi. That means he's an Ashkenazi here. He's like an Ashkenazi. Tzachakno, <laughs> Uvani. The whole life uh, was around Israel. Even, even my, second, my second wife, who is a Kshikse, Catholic, she was in Israel. My mother and father were buried in Israel. And I see them every time I come. Last Friday, my sister and I drove there. First we went to the Andrew Israel and they wanted to take pictures, but such hooligans, such disorder. I'm, I'm not going to talk. I can't do one thing properly. They all come schnorers, schnorerai, for this and for this and for that. You'll find my name everywhere. And, and I finished 30 years ago. I finished my walk. <laughs> but uh, no, why should I have any regrets? I mean, I love Israel. I can't stand Israel for what it has become. This guy uh, Meila and this guy Meila and this guy is caught with his hand in the tail and that guy is caught in, you know, is, is it like in the United States? Yes, there are a lot of that in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of bribery in the United States. Um, but we can't afford it. We are not, no, we are, I'm Sgula. We, we were told that God uh, chose us. We can't, we have to, whatever we can. I'll give you an example. I mean, I don't, it's not so much for the thing, but give you an example. I am in Minneapolis working for Piper Jeffrey in Hopwood. It's in 1952, 53, 54, and I very fast started my business. But I worked for them. I'm chairman of the board of two companies. Every deal that I made while I'm working for Piper Jeffrey in Hopwood, every deal that I made, the commission was given to Piper Jeffrey in Hopwood. Everything I bring as a commission to Piper Jeffrey and Upwood, I'm entitled to take a commission of that. I did not because I get a salary from the company. I mean, here is a kid, Rickless, in 1952, he's only 30 years old. He already knows you don't take anything that is a conflict of interest. Do you understand? Yeah. I have been in major business from 1954 to 10 years ago. I owned casinos. I owned places. Never, never did you hear anything that says that I took something. I had airplanes. I had two helicopters. I had a 727. I had G4, G2, never. When I used the G4 or G2 or the 727 for my wife to go for performances, I paid. If I was not on the airplane, I paid the costs of, of the fight. Do you know, nobody could understand how I did what I did. So they were sure at the SEC and all the places and by the way, I only borrowed from banks. They thought I have mafia money behind me. 
five years they investigated me. Here I buy the casino in Las Vegas uh, and so on and so forth. So for sure I have mafioso. I one day I get called to the SEC. Rick, do you know uh, what's his name that used to be here, the Jew that was living here in the, in the same hotel I did? Um, uh, Maya, uh, Maya Lansky. You know who Maya Lansky yeah. is? Okay. Rick, do you know Maya Lansky? Fifteen lawyers sitting. Rick is interrogated. Rick, do you know Maya Lansky? I said, no. Did you have a meeting with Maya Lansky? No. You sure you didn't have a meeting with Maya Lansky? I said, sure. Do you have any of Maya Lansky's money? No. We have a picture of you and Maya Lansky. I said, you must be kidding. I said, no, we have a picture of you and Maya Lansky coming out of the elevator, he with his dog. I said, oh, Maya Lansky was living at the Sheraton Tel Aviv. I'm the controlling interest. He lives at the penthouse. I live at the penthouse. We came down here. I didn't even know who he was. Do you understand? They lifted me. They shook me. Couldn't find anything. The head of the SEC, who became my close friends, and then became a judge and then became a lawyer, called my lawyer one day and said, Abe, we took Rick, we shook him. We couldn't find anything. Tell him I wanted to take my, private, my company private. I didn't want shareholders. I didn't want any fucking thing. So he says, tell him to submit his papers. I will approve it. I'm the first company in the United States that was listed on the exchange that went private. Today, every Chaim Yankel, every Moshe Pischer, used my ideas. I mean, I'm not talking about this. I'm not talking about things in, in history of finance and so on and so forth. They are still talking about me. Yeah, they live my life. I'm prepared to do for Israel what I can do and, and I'm very happy with it. All right. Yeah. Well, this was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.